Hi everyone, I hope you're all doing well. For today's lecture, we're going to do chapter two. This chapter contains the aggregate measures of economic activity like output, inflation, unemployment. You've probably seen many of these concepts before. This would be a good brush up before we actually begin the latter chapters. When economists look at aggregate measures of economic activity, the first one they look at is output. But can you imagine that economists during the Great Depression didn't have access to any measures of economic activity? In fact, it wasn't until 1947 that national income and product accounts were drawn. So in today's day, output is measured using gross domestic product or GDP. The national income accounts define what GDP is, what its components are, and how to measure them. To explain how we measure them, we can use this particular example. Now let's imagine a toy economy with two firms. One is a steel company that sells steel, and the other is a car company that buys steel and produces cars. Now the steel company sells its steel for $100. It has to pay wages to its workers and hence pays $80 of wages. Therefore, their profit is $20. On the other hand, this car company sells cars worth $200. And then their costs come from two different sources. First is the $100 worth of steel that they bought. And second is the $70 cost of operating machines. Here's the $70. So they occur profit of $30. Now in this toy economy, how would we calculate GDP? Would it be the sum of sales of both cars and steel? Or would it be just the sales of cars? If the steel was used to make cars, combining them both and putting them inside GDP, wouldn't that be double counting? Here I'm going to discuss three different definitions of GDP and how they are calculated. First is the gross domestic product that calculates the value of final goods and services produced in an economy in a given period of time. If we follow this definition of GDP, then we are only going to include the sale of cars in our GDP and not steel. Because in this measure of GDP, we only calculate or we take into account the value of final goods. Final goods and services. The second way to measure GDP would be the sum of value added in the economy during a given period of time. And the third way would be to sum all the incomes in the economy during a given period of time. All three definitions of GDP would essentially give you the same answer. Now let's see how. Now if we are using the first method, that is our GDP consists of final goods and services, then our GDP would be equals 200 because we're only counting the sale of cars in our GDP because that is our final good. Steel is an intermediate good that was used in the production of cars. So that is not counted as a part of the GDP for the first measure. Now, if we use the value added method to measure GDP, we're actually calculating how much value is added by each company to the economy. So the steel company is clearly adding $100 worth of value to the economy. Now think of the car company. Their revenue is $200, but they're also using $100 worth of intermediate goods, which is steel. So the value they are actually adding to the economy is $200 minus $100, which is this $100. So basically, their value added is also equals 200. Now, if we're using the income method, to calculate or measure GDP, we're basically adding together the incomes earned by our workers as wages, the incomes earned by the owners of machines, and the income earned by the owners of the company as profit. 
So we're basically adding together the incomes of the workers, the income of the owners of machines, and the income that goes to the owners as profit income. Adding all of that gives us the same GDP that we calculated using final goods and the one that we calculated using the value added method as well. So basically whatever method you're using is going to give you the same value of GDP. And the GDP that you calculated in the last slide is actually your nominal GDP, which is the sum of quantities of final goods produced times their current price. Therefore, your nominal GDP could increase because of two reasons. First, the sum of quantities of final goods is increasing or the current price is increasing. On the other hand, real GDP actually calculates the sum of quantities of final goods times their constant prices. That is, it calculates the GDP if the prices would have stayed constant and not changed over time. Now let's look at this calzone economy for three years. So nominal GDP is easy to calculate. It is basically the quantity of calzones times the price of calzones. Now if we are calculating real GDP, keeping prices constant at the 2015 level, then all you have to do is multiply the quantity of calzones in each year but by the price of calzone in 2015 only. So 300 times 7 is 2100. 400 times 7 is 2800. And notice that the nominal GDP is equal to the real GDP here. And that is because the year that you pick as your base for constant prices is the year where your nominal GDP is equal to your real GDP. And for 2016, your real GDP at $2,015 is again 450 times 7, which is $3,150. Now let's look at a couple of definitions. We already know what GDP per capita is. We need to use our real GDP. So your GDP per capita is real GDP divided by population. And then we need to remember what GDP growth rate is. So your GDP growth rate for year T is equals to your GDP in year T minus the GDP in the last period, which is T minus one divided by your GDP in period T. When this growth rate is positive, we know we are having an expansion in the economy. When this growth rate is negative, we know that we're having recessions. It was rather easy to calculate real GDP for the calzone economy. However, the problem in constructing real GDP in reality is that there is obviously more than one final good in the economy. Real GDP must be defined as a weighted average of the output of all final goods. And this brings us to what the weights should be. Now the weights could be relative prices. We could use relative prices to measure the weights. But that also raises the question of what if relative prices change over time? Should we use the relative prices of a particular use for a particular year as weights or should we change the weights over time? And because these questions are raised, we have measured or economists have measured something called the real GDP in chained dollars. Now here, the nominal GDP is rather easy to calculate. It is your quantity of calzones times the price of calzones. It's your quantity of board games times the price of board games. You add them up and then your nominal GDP for year zero is 100. In the same way, we can also calculate the nominal GDP for year one. However, 
What's challenging is the next part. So we want to calculate the real GDP of year zero in year one prices. So basically quantity of year zero times the price of year one. 10 times five and then the quantity of year zero times the price of year one. And that's how we get $80 here. And in the same way, we can calculate real GDP for year one in year zero prices. So quantity of year one times the price of year zero. Again, quantity of board games in year one times the price of board games in year zero which gives us a real GDP of $125 in year one at year zero prices. Now remember that we're doing all of this following these steps to calculate the change real GDP. Because we calculated real GDP for both year zero and year one prices in the last slide, we can calculate real GDP growth with year zero as base year to be 25%. That is an increase from $100 to $125. In the same way, we can calculate real GDP growth with year one as the base year. And we calculate it as 31.25%. That is an increase from $80 to $105. Now let's follow these steps to calculate the change real GDP. The first step is to choose a base year. And in this base year, we will have nominal GDP equals real GDP. So in this example, we choose year zero as the base year. Now the next step is to calculate the real GDP growth rate from year T to year T plus one using prices in both year T and year T plus one and average them. So basically you have to calculate the real GDP growth rate from year zero to year one using prices in both year zero and year one. And then we're going to average them. So basically what we did here, real GDP growth with year zero as the base year and real GDP growth with year one as the base year. So we have these two growth rates and now we're going to average them. And their average term comes out to be 28.13%. 28.13% or 0.2813. So your real GDP in chain dollars can be calculated as 1 plus the average real growth rate from period t to t minus 1 times the chained real GDP at period t. So it's basically 1 plus 0.28 times 100, which was our base chained real GDP, which is equals to 128. And this 128 is actually our real GDP in chain dollars. Now let's move on to another set of aggregate measures of economic activity, which is represented by unemployment. Now the definition of employment incorporates the people who have a job. And the definition of unemployment, it includes the people who don't have a job but are actively looking for one. So if you don't have a job and you're not looking for a job, then you're not considered as unemployed. The labor force is equal to the number of people who are employed plus the number of people who are unemployed according to this definition. And the unemployment rate can be calculated as the number of people who are unemployed divided by the labor force or the sum of employment and unemployment. Here is a simple example from the book. In July 2015, an average of 148.9 million people were employed. 
and 8.3 million people were unemployed. What was the unemployment rate? According to our unemployment rate formula, it is equal to the number of people who are unemployed, that is 8.3 uh, million people, divided by the labor force, which is 148.9 plus 8.3 million people, equals 5.3%. Now recall what the definition of unemployment is. It is the number of people who don't have a job but are actively looking for one. And this actually excludes discouraged workers. These workers are those who are unemployed workers but they have given up looking for a job after searching for a job, usually during times of high unemployment. And because of these discouraged workers, because these discouraged workers are not counted as a part of unemployed workers, we are the measure of unemployment actually understates the true extent of unemployment. Another definition to remember is the labor force participation rate, which is equal to the ratio of labor force to uh, the working age population. So why do we care about unemployment? Unemployment definitely has negative effects on the well-being of the unemployed. Even if they're receiving unemployment benefits, I mean, workers in most states in the United States are eligible for only for up to only 26 weeks of benefits from st state-funded unemployment compensation programs. But this still has a psychological cost associated with it, with taking unemployment benefits. Think about the discouraged workers who finally give up on finding a job. What happens after 26 weeks of unemployment benefits? What if they become permanently unemployed? In addition, unemployment is also a barometer for how well the economy is doing. If unemployment is really high, it is a signal that the economy is not allocating resources to those who deserve it. On the other hand, if unemployment is too low, the economy may be overutilizing resources and hence suffer from labor shortages. When unemployment is too low, this may also lead to overheating of the economy and overheating leads to high inflation rates. Now let's move on to another aggregate measure of economic activity, which is the inflation rate. The inflation rate actually can tell you a lot about the economy. If prices are increasing, if prices are falling, it's always a signal of how the economy is doing. Inflation is a sustained rise in the general price levels. The inflation rate is the rate at which price level rises over time. So the inflation rate at time t can be calculated as the price at time t minus the price at time t minus 1, which is the previous period, divided by the price at t minus 1. Deflation, on the other hand, is a sustained decline in the price level. It corresponds to a negative inflation rate, which is also not a good sign for the economy. There are different ways of calculating the price level in an economy. One of them is called the GDP deflator, which is a price index. And the GDP deflator is equal to your nominal GDP divided by your real GDP. Your GDP deflator also has an intuitive interpretation. If you multiply the real GDP by the GDP deflator, you get back the non nominal GDP. Another way of measuring the price level is the Consumer Price Index, or CPI. It measures the cost in dollars of a specific consumption basket of goods and services over time. And this list of goods and services, it is updated once every 10 years. So since this is an index, it means that it is equal to zero in the period chosen as the base period. Hence, the price level itself has no significance, but you can use it to compare between the base year price and the current year price. So again, we have a similar question. Why do we care about inflation? Well, hypothetically, 
If all prices rose at the same time, then inflation would only be a minor inconvenience. By all prices, I mean wages are prices too. They are prices from the labor market. So if prices of goods and services increase at the same rate as wages in an economy, then there wouldn't be, there wouldn't be a problem because workers would still be able to afford the same consumption basket. That is why this situation is sometimes called pure inflation when all prices rose at the same time. But this situation actually does not exist. Wages tend to be a little rigid or sticky as they are called, which means that even if prices of goods and services kept on increasing, wages don't increase at the same rate. And thus, inflation ends up affecting the real income distribution in an economy. Also, frequent fluctuations in relative prices can lead to a lot of uncertainty in the economy. It leads to consumers being confused about what they want to buy in the future because price levels fluctuate so much. It makes it harder for firms to decide about future investments. In general, it just leads to a lot of uncertainty in the economy. Even though the measures of aggregate economic activity that we have been discussing tell us a lot about the economy that we are studying, they tell us very little about the distribution of incomes in these economies. They tell us very little about the level of inequality in these economies. And that's why we need something to measure inequality. And we do that using a Lorentz curve. The Lorentz curve is a graphical representation of the income or wealth distribution of a country. It shows what proportion of wealth is held by what proportion of the population in a country. Using the Lorentz curve, we can calculate what is called a Gini coefficient. And this Gini coefficient is actually a way to measure inequality in a country. Okay, so the graph that you're looking at right now is going to help us measure inequality. This graph actually tells us what percentage of income is held by what percentage of the population in a country. The pink line that you're looking at on the graph, or pink purple, is the line of perfect equality. Okay, so every point on this line represents perfect equality. The blue line is the Lorentz curve of any country. Okay. So if we draw a line here, okay? So according to the line of perfect equality, 20% of the population of a country should have only 20% of its wealth. However, in reality, that is very different. Since the Lorentz curve tells us the level of inequality in a country, what we see is that, according to this Lorentz curve, 20% of the population of this country has even less than 5% of its income. This difference tells us the high level of inequality present in this economy. If the Lorentz curve of an economy is equal to their line of perfect equality here, the pink one, then we would say that this country has perfect distribution of wealth. On the other hand, if the Lorentz curve of an economy is equal to this green line over here, then this economy would be a very unequal economy in which almost 100% of the population only holds even less than 1% of their wealth, which is the highest inequality there can be. So this area A over here tells us the extent to which an economy is unequal, the distance between the Lorentz curve and the line of perfect equality. Different Lorentz curves can be drawn on the same graph to compare the extent of inequality in these in different countries. And a Gini coefficient can be calculated 
to understand the extent of inequality. And this Gini coefficient is the area of A divided by the area of A plus B. As I mentioned before, when the Lorentz curve is equal to the line of perfect equality, which is the pink line in the last slide, then we know that that economy has equal distribution of income, perfectly equal distribution of income. And hence, the Gini coefficient associated is equal zero. On the other hand, if the Lorentz curve is the green vertical line, this means that one person in that economy holds all of its wealth. In that situation, we would say that that is the most unequal an economy can be. So the Gini coefficient would be equals one. This means that the Gini coefficient travels between zero and one, zero being the most equal distribution an economy can have, and one being the most unequal equal distribution an economy can have in terms of income distribution. An easy way to calculate the Gini coefficient would be to calculate the areas under the graph that we just saw using normal area formulas. You can find out the Gini coefficient using this practical example. Practical but simple example. Suppose the lowest paid 25% of people in an economy earn 10% of income. Further, suppose the middle 50% of people in an economy earn 40% of income. And suppose that the top 25% earn 50% of the income. Calculate the Gini coefficient. Given the information, we can plot the points and connect them to form a Lorentz curve. So the Gini coefficient in this case would be this entire area divided by the entire triangle. So if, because you know all the numbers here, it's easy for you to calculate the values. For example, if we divide that example into three compartments, left, middle, and right, let's think about how to calculate this bit of the graph. You would have to calculate the area under this triangle and from that entire triangle you need to deduct this part of the triangle and then you would have this area same way you could also do the same and find out these areas for the middle and the right compartments using formulas of area under a triangle an area under a trapezoid, we can divide that entire graph into three segments and then find out the area under the curve. You can find out the three areas using these two formulas. And then you can find out the total area between the line of equality and the Lorentz curve by adding up these three areas. And then you can find out the Gini coefficient by using the total area between the line of equality and the Lorentz curve and dividing that by the triangle. Look at the graph in the slide. It tells us the relationship between output growth and unemployment rate. It is downward sloping, which means they have a negative relationship. If one increases, the other decreases. So if output growth is high, unemployment will decrease. This actually makes sense. Imagine an economy with very high output growth. Obviously, if output, output growth is high, this means that firms are hiring more and more workers and producing more and more output. And since firms are hiring a lot of people, unemployment is likely to decrease. 
This relationship was first examined by U.S. economist Arthur Oaken, and for this reason, this has become known as Oaken's Law. Oaken's Law implies that with very high growth, the unemployment rate is likely to decrease to very low levels. But intuition would tell us that when unemployment rate is really low, the economy is likely to overheat. Because when the unemployment level is really low, this puts upward pressure on inflation and price levels are higher. This means that the relationship between inflation and unemployment is a negative one. If unemployment is low, inflation is higher. In 1958, New Zealand economist A.W. Phillips plotted this relationship and found a graph that looks very similar to what we are looking at right now. His graph was also downward sloping, which pointed towards the negative relationship between inflation and unemployment. However, this relationship is not always true. Recall that in, in the 1970s, many economies were facing something called stagflation. That is, inflation and unemployment were rising at the same time. So even though the Phillips curve doesn't always seem consistent, but still the Phillips curve was a very big contribution to economics. And the last thing we will be discussing in today's lecture is the time horizon of macroeconomic policy. It is very important to differentiate between the different time horizons because the effects of different macroeconomic policies have different implications over the short, medium, and long runs. In the short run, say in one or two years, it is really the fluctuations in aggregate demand that determine total output. In the medium run, like a decade, it is the economy's productive capacity that determines output. That is, the amount of labor they have, that is, the stock of capital they have, is what determines output. And in the long run, it is innovation, technological progress, and research and development what determines what productive capacity can be. I've reached the end of my lecture. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. And have a nice day.